a couple of housekeeping points. As you'll have just seen, the event will be recorded. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, if you can keep your sound muted at all times, and if you want to have your camera switched on, that's fine. For those of you who are watching, if you want to have your Zoom set on speaker view, then you can see our lovely speakers in full view on your computer screen. But that's entirely your call. The, um, with regard to the format of the event, it's an hour and we will finish at 7.30 because I want to watch EastEnders. Yes, I am sad and boring. Um, and what we'll do is, I'll in a moment, I'll get the speakers to introduce themselves and then I'll spend about 40 minutes, 35 minutes, having a chat to them about their career sort of journeys and experiences of being a lawyer in the case of two of our speakers and um, for um, Nettie, why she's going down that route and what it's like being a student. Before, um, and then we'll take questions from the audience, but before we do the introductions, I wanted to find out from you all what your sort of current situations are. So how many of you are current Barbary SQE students who have therefore sort of pretty much committed to pursuing a career in law. If you can just do a quick vote with your hands up, uh, hopefully you know how to do your, show, show your hands. Okay, so quite a few. Yep. Okay, so this will give, uh, make sure that we pitch our sort of what we say accordingly. And how many of you are sort of torn between, um, am I gonna do this, am I not? So I, in other words, either a mature undergraduate student or someone doing a completely unrelated career to law and thinking of um, changing to law. So those of you who have voted, if you could put your hands down and then, so I can see how many of you are sort of sitting on the fence, so to speak, and might need a bit more cajoling. Okay. So a few of you, great, brilliant. Okay, let me tell you a bit more about my stuff. So I'm a career changer, interestingly, but I've done the complete opposite. I studied law at Warwick and then trained and became a um, lawyer at Linklaters and qualified into their corporate team. And then I switched careers from law to journalism because though I loved being a lawyer, I knew that longer term it wasn't for me. And I sort of fell into it through sort of cultural pressure, didn't really know what the hell I was doing as a student. And I really wanted to be a journalist. So it made complete sense that when I decided to switch to that I would pursue a career in journalism. So I spent nearly 10 years as a journalist on the lawyer magazine, five of which were, were spent focusing on careers related content. I then uh, changed careers again because I'm quite greedy and switched from journalism to recruitment. And I had a focus on placing qualified lawyers into top US law firms and then I decided actually that I didn't like being employed after all and decided to um, pursue my own sort of consultancy work and set up my own shop and it comprises a combination of things including careers consulting and coaching and as I've already said I'm retained by Barbary to support um, students on their prep courses. I also do loads of work with law firms and support some of their trainees who miss out on internal NQ positions once they finish their training. So I'm really familiar with not just the initial stage of converting your studies into a training contract or other forms of qualifying work experience, but also converting your qualifying work experience, be that paralegaling or a training contract into a newly qualified solicitor position. As well as sort of careers consultancy, I do skills training. And again, I'll be running skills training sessions for Barbary students. And then finally, if that's not enough, I fell back in love with journalism and I launched last year, Cheeky Little Careers, which is my careers and wellbeing blog for students and qualified lawyers. Plenty of free information on there. So do check it out, including an section entirely dedicated to changing careers and another one dedicated to leaving law if you decide actually it's not for you. Anyway, enough about me because tonight isn't really about me. Um, it's about our three special guests. So why don't I get Nettie, Nick and Tony to introduce themselves. Let's start it with Nettie, only because she's nearest to me on my computer screen. Nettie, so you're not yet a qualified lawyer, but very much a career changer. Tell me a bit about yourself. Right, thanks, Susanara. So yeah, I'm Nettie. Um, so I'm the most junior person on the panel in terms of career progression in law. I'm currently studying at the University of Law. Um, I'm doing the LPC MSc in Law, Business and Management. And I'm a future trainee at CMS, where I'll be joining the London office. Um, so in terms of my 
pro progress to reach in this point. I was actually a full-time mum and carer for many years. Um, when my younger daughter was diagnosed with complex special needs, I ran a home education program for her for six years. Um, I employed a team of people that I trained to deliver a specialised curriculum that was designed specifically for her. And then as a result of my experience with her, um, I then worked for several years as an education advisor um, and a volunteer coordinator providing advocacy services to children, young people and families with special educational needs and disability. Thank you. We'll, ask, we'll come on to why you decided to pursue career in law in a moment. Nick, now you've also worked in education, but as a teacher before switching to law. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll start from where I am now and then work backwards. I, I'm, I'm Nick Parker. I work as an associate at Baker McKenzie in the banking finance practice, uh, where I basically put loans together for, for a living. Um, before that, I lived and worked in China for five years. I worked most recently as a journalist in Hong Kong, uh, where I ran a small local magazine. And then before that, uh, you are right, Hesmara, I was a teacher uh, for four years um, and I self-funded the GDL in Hong Kong and did it part time while working as a teacher. Thank you. We'll ask you why law in a moment as well. Now, Tony, you blow my mind because you were a doctor and then decided that wasn't enough exams, so I'll become a lawyer. Go on, go for it. Where are you? What are you up to at the moment then? You're at Bird and Bird? Uh, yeah, so I'm a junior associate in the data protection team at Bird and Bird. Um, and before transitioning to law, I was an anaesthetist. So I like to tell people that I'm doubly qualified in putting people to sleep. Um, that's not a new joke, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does get less. Um, yeah, so I um, I originally uh, studied in St Andrews and the University of Manchester, um, and I uh, practiced in the NHS for about ten years, and finished my um, sort of postgraduate medical exams and then transitioned across to law. Um, I initially thought that I might be interested in sort of life science patent work, which is, right. um, yeah, but I, I eventually ended in, in data protection, so, and happily so. Right, um, so you weren't tempted by clinical negligence and I take it either. No, um, no, it's a bit too close to home. <laughs> okay, great, right, so let's start with why law? So Nettie, what attracted you to a career in law and this is a really important question because it's something that students are going to ask be asked on application forms and also at interviews and so many students feel really sort of panicked when that question is um fired at them so let's see how Nettie answers go on no pressure oh that yeah no pressure indeed <laughs> um well I, i'll speak from my experience so for me um, it was really a return to an original ambition, really. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree many years ago, um, last century, in fact, I can say, um, at UCL in modern languages. Um, and when I finished that, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I thought law was a, a good career. I think possibly like you, Hasnara, a little bit of family pressure. Um, but then I, my life just went in a different direction, as I've kind of alluded to. I had... Um, I had two children, my younger daughter got diagnosed with this condition and it just took over my life, which went in a completely different direction. Uh, as I said, I ended up running this home education program for her. I ended up being a special advisor. But what was interesting was that there was a common kind of legal theme throughout all those years, like over a decade. Um, when it came to running her home program, I, I had to advocate for funding from my local authority to fund her programme because sure. I had to employ a team of people. It hadn't been done before, didn't really know how to go about it. So I really just researched the law myself, taught myself everything I needed to know to become a special needs and disability specialist and then challenged my local authority to fund it, which they did. Um, and then, as I said, in the career I went into as an advisor, I ended up um, managing a team of volunteers to deliver educa um, educational advice, information, advocacy services. And so to do that, I had to know the law around special educational oh. needs and disability myself. Mm. So again, I was self-training, I was learning stuff around the law. So there was this theme that just carried out, you know, throughout all these years, even though I wasn't a qualified lawyer. Mm. Um, 
and so it I just thought it was interesting it just kept coming up in my life in various forms I founded a music charity I worked as a governor I did all sorts of roles that kind of had some kind of overlap with the law um, but I just kept putting it off I just kept thinking oh it, the time's passed it's too late I'm too old that ship sailed um, and I think I probably would have stayed in my job I'd still be there today it was comfortable I was good at it I was well paid it was convenient but um, I had a conversation with my older daughter just before she was going off to university she was talking about all her fears and worries uh, about what to do and I was doing the mum thing of saying follow your dreams follow your heart do what you really want to do not what you think you should do and she just turned around to me and said well why don't you take your own advice because she knew I'd always been talking wow. about a legal career and I just hadn't done it and it was just such a pivotal moment because there's just nothing like being held to account by your own child um and so I just I didn't have any more excuses I just thought well it's now or never I've got to bite the bullet or accept that I I, I never did what I uh, support my children to do a what few weeks later I was enrolled fear? at Birkbeck sorry what was the biggest fear that was putting you off I think it's kind of what I've already alluded to I sort of thought I'm too old I've left it too late um I was concerned I didn't have the relevant experience. At this point, I knew I was thinking of commercial law and I hadn't had any kind of corporate background. I didn't have commercial experience at that point when I made the decision to take the degree. I, yeah. I got some experience later on, but at the point that I made the decision, I didn't have any. And I just wasn't sure that I was going to be someone that would actually get that kind of opportunity that a firm would take the chance of sponsoring me and yeah, yeah and training me. So, yeah, a lot of self-doubt, really, a lot of negative self-talk. It was all of my own doing, really. When it came down to it, I obviously found there was a way. And when I speak to career changers and mature candidates, that is, you know, a recurring theme. You know, I've left it too late. The employers are going to take me seriously. You know, I love that phrase, the ship has sailed. And all of those are self-limiting beliefs. These are, you know, stories we tell ourselves as to why we Absolutely. can't do it. So good for your daughter to give you the nudge that you needed. Yes. <laughs> She's been brought up well. Indeed. So, Nick, how hmm. about you? Did you have any? So were you dabbling in law-related things like um, Nettie, or did you find other ways of generating interest in a in legal career? Yeah, I, I suppose before I, before I start talking about myself, I just want to say what what what, what Nettie said. You know, to, to to the participants, what one said is kind of really important because you, as a career changer, you yeah. you will face more hurdles when you go into this career it, it is geared the way that the application process is geared it's geared for graduates it's, it's geared for people who are, are at university now I don't think it I, at least when I did it I don't think it was particularly friendly to people who are changing career um, but it's really important that you don't put your own barrier in front of yourself right it's really it's really important that you are not the thing that counts you out um, so I, I think you know Nettie thank you for sharing that because I thought that's wonderful really 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 impressive um and you know a, a good example to follow if you're if you're watching in as, as, a, as a participant um for, for, for me personally I, I suppose there's like there, there's the answer I'd give in an interview and there, there's you know I think on reflection probably the honest answer the the answer that I gave in the interview and you know is is to at least one degree true is that I uh, I'd saved a bit of money after working for a couple of years um, and I wanted to invest in myself. Um, my, my options were go back to uni and do like a master's or a PhD, but I'd done foolishly uh, studied philosophy as a bachelor's. So kind of rule that out. Uh, and then I thought about starting my own business, but I was maybe 24, 25 at the time uh, and an idiot. Uh, so that was also ruled out. So I thought that the middle ground between sort of uh, semi-aspirational reaching and financial stability uh, would be law. Uh, but I think the honest answer is that, you know, I, I, I applied to do the GDL and to, you know, in my mind, make the career switch when I was a teacher. Um, and you know, I, I, I went to a grammar school, but I was raised by a single immigrant mother. And li living in Hong Kong, there's a lot of bankers and lawyers and people who yeah. work in professional services and I honestly I think I felt small in, in you know I think I felt small growing up and I think I felt small 
in that environment where you know I was you know I, I, I'd look at other people's lives you know especially, especially people who like their parents were lawyers or their, their parents were like working for the lawyer or something and I'd yeah. just be I'd be so jealous of sort of the opportunities the people they knew the things that they were able to do and that I felt that I couldn't mm. and so I think that you know tra transitioning into law I don't know kind of helped me plug that sad miserable hole that, that I, I felt in myself um I suppose that's the honest answer that you know doesn't leave this room thank you for sharing that and for being so candid you know and I think that you know just to highlight that there is usually a textbook answer that you prepare for interviews and the one that is really the cause or the reason for doing something um but if you can if you can blend the two then i think that's what makes the strongest response to these but definitely don't say the following which is i went to into law or i want to go into law because i want to help people or because i want to make lots of money i think you can say the sort of you know the challenging work the sort of variety etc but you know nick i'm so glad that you shared that because those are often key drivers for people entering the profession yeah. So Tony, you mentioned that, you know, you did one role that was putting people to sleep. Um, and I can see the logic, you know, law, then specialising in sort of patents work, that science background, and there's a real need there. And I can see why, you know, of the three guests I've got here in front of me, you'd be the one that probably a lot of firms would target, but the risk is that they push you towards those areas that you might mm. not necessarily want to. Similarly, and, you know, and that can be your biggest strength. Um, and it's something I say to students, that if you have got a previous career that is aligned to a sector that a firm that you're targeting specializes in, that that's something you should certainly highlight. But what if you don't want to do that, like clinical negligence? How did you sort of go about deciding what sort of lawyer you wanted to become? Um, so uh, I did a lot of kind of informational interviews and that's something that I would advise to anyone who's thinking of changing career and for me it, I didn't sort of have a long-standing desire to be a lawyer or wake up one day and think I want to be a lawyer it was much more of a push factors of um, I felt like I wanted to take some time away from medicine and I wasn't quite sure what that would look like or what I wanted to do and I just I just started reaching out to people you know people I knew well, people I hadn't spoken to in years, people who were friends of friends and got a sense of what their, what their careers were like, you know, how, what their, you know, the things that matter to me, like um, having a bit more agency um, sort of work-life balance. I say that slightly ironically now, um, but, um, but I sort of figured, tried to figure out the things that were important to me and then get an idea from people um, who I could connect with. And um everyone I reached out to couldn't have been more open and, and willing to share. So if, if you, if anyone who's watching um, is interested in doing something like this, I would say don't hesitate to reach out to people because 99 times out of 100, they're always really happy to offer advice. Um, and then um, I sort of started, I'd actually <laughs> kind of discounted law in my head. Um, and th then somebody cl close to me asked if I if I hadn't considered it. And I thought, well, you know, I don't really, I'm not really sure that I have the right skills and so on. And then they listed out attributes and skills that I had mm -hmm. that they thought would be good uh, skills of a lawyer. So again, it's the self-limiting beliefs um, piece. Um, and, uh, and then when I started to think more about law and I realized that a lot of the things that I enjoy, like problem solving um, are, are aligned with, um, with this career. Um, and then I spoke to lawyers, obviously, and asked them what kind of law they did. And someone suggested to me, I, d I knew I didn't want to do clinical negligence, um, not because I was involved in any sort of big clinical negligence issues, but more because if when I'd be either acting against my old patients or against my old colleagues, I didn't, that felt like it'd be emotionally quite difficult. Um, and, and again, it's sort of very closely aligned with the world that, um, that I was trying to move away from, I guess. Um, so I applied to Bird and Bird specifically because it's um, got a strong reputation in life sciences and because I thought I would be an attractive candidate to them. And my first seat was in data protection and I just fell in love with the area of law and with them, um, with the people I work with. Um, and I didn't, I did do a seat in IP in patent litigation, but in the end, um, it, they could win me back after, after I fell in love with DP. <laughs> so that's um, that story. 
But um, if I can make a little comment, first of all, yes. um, I, I really appreciate the vulnerable sharing of my co-panelists who, who I hadn't met before today. Um, Nettie, I think your story is so inspiring. And Nick, you, I, I really hadn't expected such a vulnerable answer from you. It was really, really blowing me away. Um, so I guess my, my contribution from that point of view is um, when you're when you're a career changer, there are push factors and pull factors. And a lot of the time you're, you're driven to change career because of the push factors, because you want to get out of the situation that you're in. And for me, that was burnout in the NHS. And somebody said to me the, um, the phrase, you can't keep setting yourself on fire to keep other people warm. Um, and, and that drove me. And then I, through this sort of pathway, I realized the things that, I, that attracted me to law. So when you're talking about an interview sense, you want to focus on the pull factors. Um, I think about it like dating. You don't want to go on a date and tell you know, the person you're dating all about your ex. Um, so <laughs> I love um, that analogy. So yeah, that would that would be um, a tip for me. And the other thing is, figure if, if it is something like burnout, think about if there's things in you that are, you're going to take with you into that new career. Because for me, there de- I still suffer from that risk of burnout because I do just take on too much and overcommit. Um, so yeah, you might not it might not solve all of the the problems that you're looking to solve but Tony it's funny you should say that about taking some of the sort of behaviors in your previous career into your new career you know I was a lawyer for three years and I the way I approach my work I'm a workaholic um you know that that's what being a city lawyer does to you it kind of like it's enshrined in your brain as to the quality of output and deliverables and how you approach the sort of client sort of mandates we've discussed the sort of self-limiting beliefs and thank you so much to all three of you for being so so open about the sort of psychological barriers you had to overcome to get you to that point now nick touched briefly on the more tangible you know operational barriers that career changes face the main one being that law firm recruitment processes are geared quite heavily towards your traditional 20 something year old undergrad who is in the penultimate year of their law degree so what i would love to hear from all three of you is if you had to pick one big obstacle that you overcame that was a game changer for you what would that be and any yeah, so if, we, if I can have one example each, because I'm conscious that we've got a lot to cover, and I also want to give the students an opportunity to um, to ask you questions as well. Go on, Nettie, you go for it first. Oh, I was still thinking, I thought, oh, <laughs> an obstacle that's a game changer. First of all, I just want to say, because I know Nick and Tony, you're both obviously further Um, ahead than I am and I have to say that actually even in the last few years I've noticed a shift in firm recruitment policies towards career changes I think that more firms are much I I don't you may you're probably more aware of this than I am as well as Nara but I think that there's been a concerted effort from some of the big firms to really start looking seriously at career changes um, and adapt some of their recruitment policies to reflect that that interest so in my experience, I, I, I would say that I've, there's been a noticeable shift from when I first started my degree to last year when I was actually making the applications. Um, and obviously the fact that all of us did actually get there eventually proves that there are firms that are willing to take on career changes. Um, I'm well, sorry, I'm sorry. Well, sorry. Your example, can I just interrupt one moment? I agree with you 100% about this shift in recruitment practices. And one piece of advice I would give to students listening in is look at the types of firms that profile career changes, mature applicants, because those are the ones that are going to be more open to engaging with candidates from non-traditional backgrounds. And the three on display here this evening are a good starting point, just a, just a hint. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's exactly like, what I'm Yay, saying. we can offer people. And I know I do a lot of work with CMS and they have loads of career changes. Exactly. Ranks. And when I approached Bird and Bird about getting involved, they were like, we love career changes. So there you go. That's a nice tip. Right. Has that given you enough time to think of your game changing sort of obstacle solution to and- Nettie? I think actually, I don't know that, again, because I think I probably was pushing a slightly more open door. 
Um, I don't think there was anything that I perceived as being a real obstacle. I think it's the stuff we've already talked about. It was more about the, the obstacles I was putting in place myself that actually were not reflected back to me by the firms that I was applying to. Um, I think it's probably based on experience that the firms that have actually taken that option of taking on career, chain is, career changes see the value that people like Nick and Tony bring and then that then it becomes an easy decision to adapt recruitment policies that encourage more career changes in um, so I wouldn't say that I face like a huge obstacle as such I think probably for me mm -hmm. it was more around the fact that well, so I think I mentioned I went to Birkbeck to do my master's degree um, and Birkbeck doesn't get visited by law firms for law fairs and you don't get speakers coming along and and it's kind of opening the doors to commercial law. So I found myself in the position of having to really put myself out to find the information, to attend events, to, to get that information that I think is probably put on a plate more for your 20 year old undergrads at Russell Group Universities, for example. Um, so really, I think it was it was that whole process of navigating how to find the information that would allow me to get my foot in the door. Um, and in the end, I really took my time over that. I didn't I didn't put in applications while I was studying. I spent two, <laughs> typically risk averse lawyer attitude. I thought I'm going to spend two years really researching and knowing what I want. And I'm not just going to throw out the 30 speculative applications. I'm going to pick the firms I actually see myself at and put in good applications to that those few firms and that is what I did and as you said Hisnara I picked firms that I could see had already had already gone down the road of taking on career changes so I knew I wasn't going in as like their, their guinea pig and the very first person yeah. that they might do that with because that's obviously going to lessen my chances yeah. Um, so yeah I was quite targeted about who I applied to and that was one of the factors. I have another tip actually with regard to how to target firms the way firms are split is by practice areas or by sectors. And one thing I've noticed is that firms that focus on sectors like CMS, I think Bird and Bird do the same, um, they do tend to have this slightly more open door policy when trying to attract career changes because what they're doing is tapping into the knowledge that that individual has already gained from that previous sector. But I do have a follow up question for you, let's be if I ask Nick and uh, Tony the same question. The, obstacle that jumps out at me when I think of you and your CV is you're going to be joining a top international firm doing commercial work as a trainee, but you have zero inter commercial or international experience on your CV. How did you overcome that and convince a firm like CMS to take you seriously? Um, well, I think partly actually it's something Tony touched on as well. It's about recognising the skills that a commercial law firm is looking for in a trainee and subsequent lawyer, which are not which are not to be found solely within the commercial sphere. So it's about recognising what I could bring that could that lines up with what they're looking for. That was number one. That actually was the hardest obstacle because those were the things that I was struggling to to line up in the beginning it was just it just seemed like there was my experience and it was a thousand miles apart from what I was looking to enter into um, but as I said all that research paid off I started to talk to people who were then able to actually tell me what parts of my CV did line up with the career that I was looking to go into so that was number one but the second part was I actually then did go out and get some commercial experience and non-commercial legal experience um, partly for my own interest and experience, partly actually to do exactly what you just said, Hasnara, which was to try and fill in those gaps to the eyes of a recruiter. Um, and so I got, I got, I would actually recommend this as well to all the um, attendees if they're not already doing so, is to join as many different platforms as you can, like platforms that support aspiring solicitors. So for me, that I, the most influential was a platform called Aspiring Solicitors. Um, who helped me get onto a, an internship at American Express, which led into a, a rolling contract. I ended up just staying there for ages. Um, and that was my commercial legal experience, which wow. I was then able to, to put into applications in a way that made me, I guess, more of a, a sellable product. But um, prior to that, like I say, I think it's just about identifying the skills that you probably already have and that you've developed in whichever career it is you're coming from um, 
and, and line them up with what com, what's required in commercial law. So, I mean, I won an award last year for resilience. And that if you'd <laughs> have told me a year ago that that was even possible, in, you know, from a, a commercial platform. Uh, but the resilience is, is a key skill as a, as a commercial lawyer, and it's one that is a necessity. So Absolutely. I think you, you don't always think about certain things that you already are doing or that you've got in abundance that line up nicely with the career. Yeah. So and can I just say to... that it's so, so, so easy to find out which skilled law firms value because it's in their graduate recruitment brochure. Yeah. And if you can then match that with what you've gained in this job that you've had previously, then it, do you know what? I know I don't want to oversimplify, but it ain't rocket science, is it? No, I, I definitely. But I would also say there are things that they don't spell out in their brochures that in my experience, I found that people responded really well to, which is the, the, things are like emotional intelligence and, you know, the ability to sort of, to just be appropriate, uh, appropriate I, I, I think it's all there. I think that, you know, lazy candidates are going to get nowhere. As you and, Anto and Tony highlighted, information is your secret weapon. Research, Absolutely. network, create your own opportunities to network, attend events. And if you start talking to lawyers, not only will you get a better appreciation of what lawyers do and therefore decide once and for whether it's right for you, you will then be able to spot those themes and highlight those in your applications anyway let's move on to nick so what was your game-changing step that you took mm. yeah so I, I it took me two rounds of applications okay uh to get a training contract and the first time around i went in with pretty classic overzealous male ego and i thought oh, <laughs> i've got all this work experience um you know I, I was like head of year at the school that i worked at so i a, a good teaching CV um, and I really just rattled off applications I must have submitted like 20 or 30 applications like a stupid amount and of course all of them were total crap and <laughs> I got absolutely nowhere with it uh, and then I went to this like depressive spiral thinking oh god have I just like wasted all, uh, okay. all this money that I've sank on the, on, on the GDL right, um, but I think that the thing that changed in my second year is that I really focused on building a proper support network for myself. Like when, when you are changing career, especially if you're doing it part time, it's very different to when you're an undergrad and you're you know, in a cohort where everyone around you is pushing towards the same thing. You've got a law society, you have a, like law dinners, whenever you're just chit chatting you're going to be chit-chatting about the applications process and you're going, to, you're going to pick up so much just tacitly good advice. And I think if you're, if you're trying to juggle studying law and working, you're just not, if you don't focus on it, it's just not going to happen. So I, I think what Nettie and what Hasnara have, have said about information, going to events, really putting yourself out there, it's, it's important if you're an undergrad applying, but it's even more important if you're a career changer, because you don't otherwise have this just like information just seeping into you. And, I, I, and that's what really changed in my second year. And I, I definitely wised up and thought more about myself and how, you know, the narrative that I was wanting to present to, to law firms, which, which was you know, very international, Asia focus. Um, and once I'd figured that out about myself and understood a bit more about the industry and the types of law firms and the different systems of law firms, it became much easier. And I was way more successful in my second year uh, and got the training contract um, on the back of my scheme. Yeah. Thank you again for being so honest. And a couple of points I wanted to sort of highlight this having that support network, I call it your war cabinet of cheerleaders, mentors, and set out to build that cabinet yourself because as a career changer it can be a bit lonely because in some ways although you don't have that peer pressure that you experience as an undergrad like i experienced and which is why i targeted large city law firms because that was the trophy prize that everyone wanted and it's not always necessarily the right route for everyone um so yes the peer pressure can be good because it keeps you motivated and you think shit i'm gonna miss the deadlines but then at the same time you don't um if you don't that can also be quite damaging. So that's why in some ways, 
focus on building your own network of individuals who you can turn to for help. And you can approach more formal organisations um, like aspiring solicitors. You've got Bright Network. There are loads available out there. So come and speak to me if you're a SQB uh, student at Barbary. Um, you know, there's plenty of help out there. And thank you also for being honest about making two rounds of applications. You know, because I'm probably unusual because I got my training contract pretty easily. You know, I'm that classic vanilla student, even though I had to grapple with things like disabilities, being Asian, social mobility, because I was the first person in my family to go to university. So I'm far from a traditional student. But if you look at my CV, it's extremely traditional up until I changed careers. Um, but I experienced everything from peer pressure, through, you know, which is why I ended up leaving. But uh, yeah, that network of support, not punishing yourself if you don't get the invites during the first round and not giving up and throwing the towel in the thinking you know this was a waste of time and i can imagine how frightening it would have been not to get those offers having invested so much money on paying for this gdl yourself and i know lots of students here will be self-funding you know the sqe or indeed the um gdl uh, which i know is going to be um, eventually um removed and everyone will be doing the um the SQE or whatever it's called. Um, anyway, Tony, what about you? Um, go on, go for it. One, one, um, one bit of advice, please. One, one, so one bit of advice for uh, for people applying. Um, again, I would I would go back to the dating analogy. So if you were told that you, that um, you've got one afternoon or maybe so an assessment centre or a week vacation scheme with a person, and then you have to decide whether you want to spend two years of your life with them. Yeah. Would you two years plus, you know, maybe you're going to be doing your SQE with them and your training contract or some kind of blended situation. Maybe you'll be qualified there afterwards. Yeah. Wouldn't you read every scrap of information you could find about that person? And if you do that, you'll understand who they are and yeah. whether you want to work there. And then you'll be able to write a really good application form because you'll understand what they're looking for and what you can offer them. Um, I, I think if. So I, when I did my um, applications, I picked five firms and in the end, I actually was only able to, to write two applications because it took me such a long time to write them. Yeah. Um, so I think if you're writing sort of 20, 30 application forms, you cannot be writing 20 or 30 good ones. And um, really, I, I think really, and also there aren't 20 or 30 firms that are similar enough that you'd want to spend two or three years with them. So really... It's not a numbers game. It's really an information game and a time game and investing loads of time into the process. And if you can find somebody who's in that area, so qualified commercial lawyer working in private practice, yeah. you can give your, um, give your application form a once over because that was really, really helpful to me as well. Can I just say something about sticking with that dating analogy? One thing that's worth mentioning to all the participants this evening is that the training contract or if you go down the qualified work experience route which involves paralegal for example remember these are temporary contracts okay so it's not a lifelong marriage okay so think of it as a long-term relationship and tony's right that you've got to at least think can you spend two years with this person but at the same time you're not fully committed and it may be that for so many of you you end up joining a firm and then moving on. So don't worry if the firm you end up joining as a trainee isn't your so-called dream firm, which I know so many students use saying, I've joined my dream firm. You don't know what your dream firm is until you've actually been there. So I would just drop that language and think, Do you know what, I, I will probably have two moves, three moves, even four moves in my career as a lawyer. And I know lots of lawyers who have moved for that reason. So they've started smaller and become and moved on to somewhere bigger or they've started in the regions and then moved to London sort of thing. So you may need to, as a career changer or a mature candidate, cast the net a little bit wider and then progress to the really prestigious firms, assuming, of course, that's the route you want to follow. Okay, now the next Mara, thing... Mind, I, sorry, would you mind if I just picked up on that? Well? Interrupt me, go on, go for it. And, um, another thing that was really meaningful for me was... Um, uh, when you're changing career, it feels like a huge decision. Um, and for me, I was my my identity was very fused with being a doctor, Doctor Tony. Um, and it took it took me quite a while to surgically remove 
you know, remove the sort of, um, yeah, identity from myself <laughs> and realize who I am. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I had to put myself to sleep first. Um, and, um, and when you put a lot of pressure on a decision, like, oh, I'm, I'm now lo no longer that person and I have to be another person, or I'm now committed to this identity forever or whatever it is, then it, that becomes a very, very difficult decision to make. Whereas if you just break it down into many decisions of like, okay, well, I'm going to like, learn about vacation schemes you know you know learn about training contracts learn about laws of career maybe i'll do a vacation scheme and see what that's like and and that's how i i basically sort of took little baby steps into and then then eventually i was like oh i've been qualified for two years okay that happened um so yeah it's um don't while while you should be really obsessively figuring out which firm you want to go to and sort of studying them religiously don't at the same time don't put loads of pressure that this has to be the perfect decision and you have to commit to this forever yeah thank you i'm conscious that it's 10 past seven let me ask each of you one more question um well actually not for netty because she hasn't actually started her training contract yet but nick what does your typical day involve as a banking associate at baker's uh i'm gonna give a really unhelpful answer and say that there is no typical day yay uh, that okay. cliche had to come in at some point love it uh ba banking um transactional seats in general are very spiky in the sense that you will have periods where there is a transaction happening that will be very very busy and there will be periods where there isn't as much stuff going on and you'll be very quiet uh, banking is probably one of the more extreme examples because the time frames for putting financing in place is so tight quite a lot of the time uh so what i'm trying to say is this week i've had basically nothing to do and i've had a, a really <laughs> nice time uh but just before easter it, it was it was pretty pretty mad because that's the end of financial year you know everyone's gonna get financing in place uh so that was pretty pretty hellish so it's very very up and down I suppose my bread and butter is drafting documents that put loans in place. So if you think about a mortgage, think about a very bespoke mortgage for a company. That's the sort of stuff that I draft. Um, it's that and making sure that, you know, all, all the documents that are required to put that, that financing in place, to put that loan in place um, are also done. You know, if, you, if you're buying a house, you have like your conveyancer and you'll have like a bunch of stuff that has to happen before you complete. It's, it's basically the same, um, but yeah. on a more corporate yeah. scale. And I can vouch for that as a transactional lawyer, what your work is a bit more up and down. And I would say there's also slightly less law involved. Um, yeah. What about you, Tony? What does your typical day involve? Not that you have a typical day either, I bet. Um, mine is super typical. No, no I'm joking. Um, so uh, data protection, uh, certainly in, so, so my, the team that I work in is slightly unusual. Um, a lot of firms will tend to have a regulatory and compliance team, and they might have one data protection lawyer or, or one person who does data protection as part of their um, role. Um, my, my team is very specialized in data protection. There are about 20 of us who are full-time data protection lawyers. And um, so as you can imagine, we get a lot of really interesting questions from um, cool clients um, and it's also kind of a blended area so um, so I do some of the transactional stuff that Nick was referring to and that would sort of um, involve supporting you know maybe the corporate teams or the commercial teams in making sure that the contracts they're negotiating have all the right um, data protection clauses in or um, looking at the, the data protection compliance of the target for a client who's acquiring a business. Uh, we also do sort of data protection sort of compliance projects for our clients directly um, and then the uh, then we also do some sort of more kind of litigation the adversarial work where we might interface with the regulator which is the information commissioner's office so if they if they want to um, investigate our client in some way or um, where a data subject has made a complaint either to the client or to the information commissioner's office we, we would handle that um, and we also do advisory work, which is my favorite, because as I said, I love the problem solving piece. So it's where a client comes with sort of an interesting question about something they want to do with data, uh, personal data, and whether whether they can do it and how they can do it in a way that's compliant. And um, so, for example, I, as you can imagine, I do a fair, uh, most of my work involves either sort of HR data, so where employers 
clients who, who are employers, which is everyone, want to uh, deploy some kind of uh, sort of invasive thing like monitoring their employees or um, doing background checks on employees, whether and how they can do that. And also, um, I do a lot of, as you can imagine, health work. So, um, so medical devices, like what kind of data can be collected and where, um, say, for example, uh, a doctor wants a patient to wear a medical device, the healthcare provider might be the, what's called the data controller who makes all the decisions about the data, but the person who actually makes and provides the device and supports it would be called the data processor, and they're quite limited in what they're allowed to do, but often they want to keep some of the data so they can sort of develop and improve their um, devices, so we would give advice on whether and how they could do that and what kind of um, terms they can put in place and so on. So, so you, that's I, a flavor. <laughs> And just to give you an example of how that works in real life, so recently, without probably this is too much information, but I had to do a urinary uh, test, and I actually <laughs> received an app from my GP surgery. So I downloaded an app on my phone, and then took a photo of the dipstick um, with the camera on my phone, and then that went straight to my GP. So now my yeah. information is held by a private company, which is phenomenal. So I can see why your work is so interesting because it's so relatable. Yeah. It really is. And you can imagine, especially during the last two years with COVID, between everything that people wanted to do with tests and trace. Um, so I was actually on a comment with the Information Commissioner's Office at the time. So we were sort of giving a lot of advice on those kind of things. And also a lot of employers were wanting to see what their employees were doing when they were re remote. So yeah, it was, it's been a re really interesting couple of years in data protection law. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Tony. Right, we've got 15 minutes left, so let's fire through the questions. I might not use all of them because I think some of them might not be as relevant to our um, guests as others. So first one is, um, if, there you go, I'm a lawyer already, but civil law, not common, so that's not a question. Okay, what, uh, from Lucy, I'm in a similar position to Unity. So uh, I'm sure she would have found what you said helpful. Okay, so one question is, how practical is it for someone to expect a part-time role as a new starter career switcher? Are there any particular organizations that are more open to part-time career switches relative to others? Now, the organization that jumps out to me, there, there is this new thing that is um, a, a new type of employer that's emerging within the legal services space. And these are sort of flexible working platforms. One is called Flex Legal. There's another one called AccuTrainee. Those are the platforms that are going to be more open to flexible working, part-time working. I think in the time that I've spent working as a career specialist within the legal sector, I've probably only come across a handful, a tiny handful of part-time trainees. Um, but if you may find that therefore a training contract route is less attractive for you, but perhaps explore the paralegaling route. Because as you know, if you're an SQE student, your qualifying experience can be gained via paralegaling as well. So next question, let's see if I've got anything for the, um, so yeah, so with the paralegaling route, again, this one is for me rather than the um, part of the, the panelists. The, as you know, qualifying work experience encompasses quite a few different threads, including training contracts and paralegaling, as well as volunteering in legal aid clinics, et cetera, et cetera. My advice universally across the board has always been, if you are an SQE student and are planning your QWE, make sure that you think where you want to end up once you qualify, because that is going to have a huge impact on the um, route that you take, okay? So if you want to join a firm like CMS, Bakers or Bird and Bird, then you will need to follow their sort of recruitment timeline and you will end up doing a training contract, even when firms, those three firms end up going down the SQE route and no longer offer the LPC route, because we're in this weird transitional phase at the moment, okay, where it's a little bit confusing. So if in doubt, approach individual employers directly and get their sort of individual starts on how they position SQE students. The bottom line is that they can't discriminate just because you're an SQE student, because you're, in a nutshell, the equivalent of a self-funding LPC student. The, the, the challenge is more about timing, because law firms like CMS, Bird and & Bird and & Bakers all recruit two years in advance. 
So it means that you've missed the window for vacation schemes this summer. And some of those firms do recruit almost all their future trainees from the schemes. I know CMS, for example, recruits 100% of its trainees from, from the schemes. Um, if, if we can sort of park processy questions, because this is obviously a fantastic opportunity to ask three amazing guests questions about their careers. So does anyone have a question for um, any of the panelists? I've got one for Netty, which um, is something we talked about separately, which is, you know, juggling being a mum with studying and caring so you know whether it's being a mum or other caring responsibilities i think you mentioned to me earlier that you it was like a double whammy parents and kids how did you find the time to study at the same time that yeah that's that's a good question and maybe my so, I, so i've got my daughter who's got quite profound needs who lives sure. with me obviously but i also take care of my mum at the weekends so i split her care with my sister who she lives with um, and my mum's in her 90s and has got Alzheimer's. Um, so it's it's a lot. And I'm, I'm not going to pretend that it's anything other than absolutely exhausting. And at times, at times, actually, that's that's also been the other huge obstacle. So when we talked earlier about the self-limiting beliefs, the part I left out was the role that all of this plays in those self-limiting beliefs is that I've got this huge um, sort of caring responsibility for two different people. And managing that is a huge ask. Um, and I think, I mean, in terms of practical things, the only thing I can say is that I'm hugely, hugely organised. I mean, you just have to be. There's no possible <coughs> way of managing to study work. I mean, at one point, study work and manage all the caring. Um, and, and, and really dogged and prepared to work very very hard so and this is why I won this award for resilience um it takes a huge amount of resilience and um self-care um to make sure that you are able to kind of meet all those responsibilities without a either I loved your analogy earlier Tony you know not setting yourself on fire to keep everybody else warm I mean I've definitely done that at different times um and then realizing that, yeah, that's just not sustainable. It's doable in, you know, in short periods, but actually other things need to happen to make things sustainable. So again, I think coming back to what's already been discussed, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky, but have worked hard as well at developing a very strong support network. Um, and that, that's, that's what you lean on at times when it does all feel a bit overwhelming. Um, I'm super organized, so I don't leave things to chance. I That's what I said about, you know, the two years of research before I even put in a single application. You know, that's that's me. I, it's not the same for everybody, but this is what's worked for me. Um, I try to be prepared for every eventuality. So things ideally don't take me by surprise. Um, and yeah, just kind of being sure about what you want and why you want it. So, you know, when I was talked about the fact that I'd kind of talked about wanting to pursue a legal career, and it's not the most glamorous thing in the world. I am now that I'm sort of on the cusp of starting it, there have been times where I'm like, why did I really want to do this? Um, but I was really sure about it being the thing I wanted to do, for better or worse. Um, and I think you've got to have that kind of clarity about your goals and your yeah. your why in order to justify the the kind of the pain <laughs> of having to keep really unsociable hours, sometimes you know, not being able to keep plans with people, maybe not, you know, certain sacrifices you make about how your life yeah. could be in order to get the thing that you really want. And that's the decision I've made. Of course. Since my panel are being so, so honest this evening. Let me ask Nick and Tony another question each, okay? Nick, after you made one round of unsuccessful applications, did you feel like giving up at any point? Uh, well, I paid for the course, so I was going to complete it. Um, I, I, I saw no other option, basically. Uh, I had mentally, you know, checked, not checked out of, 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 of my teaching career, but... I knew that I didn't want to do it and I knew that you know I just I, I honestly I just poured all my energy again to the training contract uh, stage um because I didn't really have a plan b um so no I, I don't think I ever thought about thought about giving up but I I, I know that lots of people you know there were, I think there were 200 people who did my course and in the second year that dropped to 
maybe a hundred, just over a hundred. So I, I know that lots of people did, you know, give up ha ha halfway through. Um, I, I would encourage everyone to sort of stick it out. You know, don't, you know, going back to what we said at the, at the start, you know, don't be your own barrier. Right? Yeah. No, that's really sound advice. So Tony, how easily did you find a training product? Cause you talked about, you know, quality, you can't, put together 30 plus good quality applications how many applications did you, you mentioned target shortlist of five did you find it quite easy or do you have to do quite a lot of selling um so i'll uh, i had i had no legal or commercial experience um before i made my um applications uh so i relied i relied a lot on the interviews that i did and then websites like um, uh, Chambers, the Chambers and Partners, so to yeah. find who the who the, peop the sort of players were in the sectors that I was interested in, yeah. um, and then Roll On Friday and Legal yeah. Cheek, which are slightly less prestigious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that, you know, had it been available at the time, because now I definitely would have. Um, but yeah, all, all of the, the online resources um, that are out there. Uh, in, um, and how, how easy was it? Well, you, you really have to figure out what the person that you're applying to is looking for. And um, they don't, they're not looking for legal skills, right? They can give you legal skills. That's the whole point of like them supporting you through the SQE or LPC or whatever um, route you're going and the training contract. What they're looking for is um, sort of qualities that you have and skills that you already have that that they can add the legal skills onto to make you a good lawyer. Um, so I don't I don't think you necessarily have to think, well, I have to do paralegaling or I have to already have the GDL. Admittedly, those things can be bonuses because you can say, well, I've already done a very similar role. Um, and then in, in terms of obviously it was, it was this, uh, I did the vacation scheme, which I really enjoyed, obviously, um, and then my studies I loved going back to being a student full-time which I, I did for 10 months and then for for the GDL and then for the LPC I worked uh, part-time while I was studying um, which is, is another thing that seems to be a barrier but actually when I spoke to Bird and Bird about it and the the provider that I was going to everyone was super supportive and making it work for me so another thing is like just ask for help when you need it um, and then doing my doing my actual training contract, I remember sitting in every single seat thinking, oh, I used to know how to do my job. <laughs> so you kind of have to sort of deal with being, you know, I, I used to be a pretty competent independent practitioner and now I don't know how to work the photocopier. Um, so so it's quite a humbling experience um, as well. Uh, but I, I don't really it's it's you learn a lot about yourself but i don't think there was anything that you know was particularly negative or difficult or that I, you know i wouldn't go back and do it the same again so yeah i think what the theme is that you know everyone has had to try really hard to get their sort of foot in the door and i mentioned that i'm quite a vanilla candidate but that doesn't mean that i did nothing and i just landed a training contract in my lap you know, I did work experience as an A-level student. I did, um, you know, got involved in pro bono work. I did debating. I did mooting. I did volunteering um, at a local charity. I entered competitions. So I did everything to make my CV stand out because the problem is there are lots of students out there who have great grades. And, it's a, and in some ways, this becomes your superpower, doesn't it, being a career changer? Because you've got emotional intelligence, you know, life experience and a you know huge you know list of transferable skills that you can bring to the to the party one question that's come up which we haven't addressed we've talked about career changes which is obviously being mature who wants to address the how did you deal with the age question i don't want to offend any of my speakers by saying you're the oldest or the youngest so go on netty I think I can safely say I'm the oldest. I'm just, I'm okay, just going to say like, that. Right? You're not as old as me. I'm the oldest. <laughs> but um, see, that's interesting. I think um, 
I was worried about that, actually. I was worried about, I, I like you, Tony, I loved going back to university, but Birkbeck is made up of mainly mature students, actually. So I wasn't an anomaly there. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even the oldest person on my course. Um, so that was that was quite a nice, gentle way back in. Um, but then once I started on the training contract applications, going to all these events, and certainly now on the LPC, I, you know, I'm studying with people that could be my children. I mean, I've got two <laughs> daughters that are the age of some of my classmates. Um, and I, again, I, it, I, my perception of it was worse than it is in reality. I was kind of scared that I'd be the grandma or something in the group. I don't know, maybe they, maybe I am and they just haven't said it, but, um, but no, I get, I love it. I get on really well with my classmates and my future colleagues. Um, I think it's actually a really interesting dynamic, which is what you hope for when you go to work, when we talk about diversity mm -hmm. and all of that. Yeah. And whether it's just lip service or whether it's actually, it, it's it's there in reality. And I think age is just another, it's, it's, it's the, um, it's the sort of less spoken about strand when we talk about diversity, isn't it? We talk about ethnicity and religion and yeah. sexual orientation and all sorts of other things, but age is one of those things that we don't, that doesn't really come up that often. And I think there can be some sort of insidious hidden uh, prejudice in terms of like being older, but I also think it brings all the other benefits that we've talked about. And from a personal perspective, I've loved it. I've found it so, it's given me a whole new lease of life being around all these these much younger people um, who who can share their experience with me. They've got a lot of the kind of hope and optimism and uh, some of the naivety, I suppose, that I'd forgotten because that's kind of behind me. And it's refreshing to be around people that remind you of that. Yeah. Um, at the same time as I hope I bring some value and benefit in um, being a slightly more level head at times. Um, so yeah, I think it's been mutually beneficial and it's been a lot easier than I expected it to be. Um, yeah, so on the I whole good. It, yeah, I think what you've highlighted is that age is another self-limiting belief, isn't it? In that, you know, it's an attitude that you adopt, you know, and say she, I'm 47 and a half years old, okay? And like you, I hang out with young people and I like to see myself as being quite young, even though my, my niece is dreading the um, hen party I'm organising for her because she thinks that I'm her frumpy auntie, okay? But look, seriously, though, joking aside, I think law firms are addressing sort of diversity centred around and inclusivity centred around age, um, simply because all of us are going to be working until we're a lot older. And just going back to my days of being a journalist or the lawyer, just to show you that it really is never too late to be a lawyer or to train as a lawyer. I remember writing a story about a trainee who happened to be a bird and bird trainer. And I'm not just making this up. And she qualified at the age of 50. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely fine. And again, as was the message I shared earlier and the panelists, you know, echoed this, you've got to pick your firm's firms carefully. And there will be some firms, of course, that want the fresh faced 20 something year old, but others, and I think hopefully an increasing number of others are, you know, value that sort of diversity that career changers and mature candidates bring to the table. Um, so there you go. I'm going to answer one final question myself, just because I know the answer to it very easy, which came from Yun, which is training in-house versus private practice. There are now increasing opportunities to train in-house, especially for those of you considering QWE via paralegaling. Okay. Again, going back to what I said earlier, you need to make sure that you have a clear idea of where you want to end up, because if you trade in house, it's quite hard, almost impossible to get a job in private practice. OK, so in terms of keeping your options wide open, getting a trading contract with a larger commercial firm will enable you to downsize later, move in house later etc etc so i'm afraid that's all i've got time to say because i did promise we'd finish on time and eastenders has started so i just want to yeah, i can to that a really really tiny tiny comment that oh, would actually recruit, Please, recruit um, people who've trained in-house into our team so it wouldn't necessarily be limiting um Perfect. You... well there you go that's fantastic to hear yeah it is yeah i mean it's hard but that's a fantastic example and thank you for sharing that because it's something I was not aware of. Um, so thank you for that. Anyway, so thank you to my three guests. You have been wonderful and so inspiring. And, you know, the vulnerability you've shown, I hope, 
you know, motivate some of the participants to really forge sort of ahead and go for it, you know, and the question you've got to ultimately ask yourself is how badly do you want it? Yeah. Because as I said, all of us have worked hard for this. It's not just landed it, you know, on a plate. No one is deserving of a training contract. No one is entitled to it. You've got to go and fight for it because it's dog eat dog eat dog eat dog out there. But use your superpowers and uh, good luck to you all. Have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. By the way, if you've loved this event, do you shout about it on LinkedIn and say that I was a wonderful host and our panelists were amazing and uh, give Cheap Little Careers and Barbary SQE Prep a massive shout out. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Bye. Yep. Bye.